Boldwood presents High Tides and Summer Skies Written by Jennifer Bonet And read by Julia Franklin The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue 2004 Matty Cranford ended the unexpected phone call from her goddaughter, Katie, deep in thought, before walking across to stand in front of the window of her sitting room in above-town Dartmouth and absently watching the activity on the River Dart. She'd been born in this house seventy years ago and had seen and known the river in all its guises, calm, choppy, and when the stormy southwesterly winds blew straight up the river, angry. This February afternoon, the wind was gusting down over the hills that surrounded the harbour, and with the outgoing tide, the river was running fast to the mouth. Matty watched the tug of the lower car ferry, battling its way across the waves from Kingsweir on the opposite bank. There had been a few occasions in the past when the combination of tide and wind had carried the ferry almost out to the castle at the mouth of the estuary. Not today, though. Today, the captain remained in control and safely brought the ferry with its cars and passengers alongside the Dartmouth landing slip. There was a luxury three-tiered yacht moored to the huge black Harbour Commission buoy in the middle of the river, its French flag on the stern furling and unfurling itself around its pole as the gusts of wind flung it around. So many boats in the river these days, both British registered and foreign. Matty still remembered how empty the harbour had been after the war, as people struggled to come to terms with peace finally being achieved. So many lives lost, so many loved ones gone forever. Matty turned her head and glanced at the bottom cupboards of the sideboard where a certain box lived the box that held so many memories of her sister Clara's life, both happy and sad. The box that had made her cry when she'd found it after her mother's death, fifteen years ago. She'd never known of its existence. The contents, a motley collection of old letters, photos, a couple of paperbacks, a silverbacked hairbrush, a ration book, some old exercise books used as a diary, bits of jewellery, and a 1944 guide to American towns. The A4 sized contained some smaller, foreign envelopes, holding a collection of handwritten letters. So little left behind of a life cut short by war. The diaries, when Matty had steeled herself to read them, had made her cry, as they brought back so many memories of her long ago childhood, and revealed the dreams and hopes of her big sister which had been so cruelly shattered by the war. Even now, thinking about Clara after all these years, Matty felt close to tears. From the day she'd learnt of Clara's death, she'd always tried to mask her feelings in public from everyone about her sister. Her parents had told her it was better that way, stiff up a lip and all that. But it had been hard. At ten years old she'd adored her big sister and inwardly knew she'd miss her forever. And that had proved to be true. Matty smothered a sigh and turned back to the view. Six decades after the war, Dartmouth was thriving again, the ravages of an era when the whole country had suffered, now largely forgotten by a younger generation who hadn't lived through those years. Life had gone on regardless. Although, if the truth were to be acknowledged, her own life had been a somewhat stagnated one, something she'd started to realise only as she grew older, when the regrets over the things she'd never experienced, the places she'd never seen, the children she'd longed for but had never had, began to creep in. The world, it seemed, was everyone's oyster these days, and she had been left behind. An urgent need to get away and live a little before she was too old had recently rooted itself in her brain. Some would say that at seventy you're already too old to change things. But 
she pushed that thought away. She longed to see and join in a world outside of darkness. It was too late for children, obviously, but there were still things out there waiting for her to explore. She was in good health. She could travel, meet people. Only one thing stood in her way, like it always had done. The wool shop. A good yarn had held her captive all her life. Breaking free from its tentacles had proved impossible while her mother lived, and afterwards the familiarity of the place had become a safe cocoon, and the years had gone past. Earlier, as she'd commiserated with an upset Katie over her unexpected redundancy, Matty had suggested she come for a holiday while she made plans and look for a new job. An invitation Katie had seemed to jump at with the words, Oh, coming home for a week's a wonderful idea. Now, Mum and Dad, thank you. I'll drive down tomorrow. A quiet whisper in Matty's head said, Maybe this could be your chance to escape and go on holiday too. If Katie accepted the challenge Matty intended to put to her in the next day or two, life for both of them would change. With Katie's help, would she finally be able to escape from a good yarn and travel and see something of the world? Was this finally going to be her time? Or was it truly too late for her to live a little? Chapter One Take over your shop, Katie Teague said, looking at her godmother, Matty. Are you serious? Never more so. Shop needs dragging into the 21st century, and I don't have the energy to do that, Maddie said. Or the inclination, she could have added, but didn't, saying instead, besides, it's more than time for me to retire. You're not ill? Katie glanced at her sharply. Maddie didn't look ill, but some people still looked in the best of health when they died, didn't they? Not ill, just tired. The shop needs a young person's input. You need a job, don't you? I promise not to interfere, and I'll give you a completely free hand to do what you want. Matty replaced her teacup on its saucer. In fact, I shall take my first ever summer holiday this year if you take over. More cream with that scone? The two of them were sitting on the terrace in Matty's secluded garden, overlooking the river Dart and enjoying the usual spread of food that Matty considered essential for a proper Sunday afternoon tea. Cucumber sandwiches, scones, Devonshire splits, clotted cream, and a homemade strawberry jam. Bert, her labradoodle, sat at their feet, ready to guzzle up any stray crumb that might come his way. Oh, Matty, Katie said, I don't know. I was planning on a couple of weeks' holiday before sending off more job applications. I can't say I'd even considered coming back here to live permanently. Well, think about it now. Give yourself a year to get a good year on back into shape, and then we'll decide whether you take it on permanently or whether we sell up and split the profits. Isn't there anyone else willing to give you a hand? Katie asked. There's only Leo. And somehow, I don't see him giving up his farm to run a shop. Katie smiled at the thought of Leo Cranford, Matty's brother William's grandson, Matty's great-nephew, and Katie's own teenage sparring partner. It had simply never happened. Leo, she knew, would drop everything to help Matty in an emergency, but he'd never liked being cooped up indoors. He was at his happiest when outside, either on the farm or messing about on the river. Matty stood up. I'll fetch another pot of tea while you decide. No pressure, then, Katie said. Of course not, but Easter and the beginning of the holiday season are only weeks away. Be good to have things organised by then. Waiting for the kettle to boil, Matty stood by the kitchen window deep in thought, praying that Katie would take on the shop. Watching her now in the garden, Matty crossed her fingers and willed Katie to make the decision she wanted her to make, a life-changing one for both of them. 
left on her own. Katie wandered along the garden path, Bert at her heels. From the vantage point by the wall at the top of the garden, she had a good view of the early spring activity out on the river. Both the ferries making their way across the river. An early tourist boat returning from Totnes, the marinas packed to capacity with boats. It was all achingly familiar, and yet so different from when she was growing up down here. Then there had only been the one marina up by the shipyard and a couple of pontoons moored mid-river downstream by the higher ferry, from where her uncle Frank had run his boat charters. These days, the harbour master had his hands full all year round, controlling the comings and goings of leisure boats of all sizes, from the several marinas now lining the banks of the river. There was so much more going on in the town these days, too. Dartmouth was no longer the sleepy riverside town she'd been determined to escape from as a teenager and find life. In the last few years, life itself had arrived down here while she'd been busy pursuing a career as a film production manager up in Bristol. A career that had been knocked off course by her redundancy a couple of days ago. She still felt numb when she remembered her last afternoon in the office. Hugo had called a midday meeting, and without warning told three of them that their contracts were being terminated with immediate effect. Times are difficult at the moment. Only way I can survive is to cut my outgoing expenses, which basically means losing stuff. He'd handed the three of them envelopes with their final wages, plus the redundancy money they were due. Instructing them to clear their desks, he'd turned and left the room without a single word of apology. Standing at Hugo's side throughout his little speech, had avoided her gaze. It wasn't until Hugo had left, and Katie was bemusedly packing her things into a box, that he came into her office. You knew this was going to happen, didn't you? Why didn't you warn me? You're supposed to be my boyfriend, for God's sake! She threw an out-of-date copy of Campaign into the waste paper basket. You're not going to tell me you didn't know. You practically run this place for Hugo. Patrick shook his head. I'm sorry, Katie. Hugo did discuss it with me, but I didn't know until this morning that you were definitely included. Besides, how could I say anything to Hugo without him guessing that you and I are more than colleagues? He'd have sacked you then anyway. You know what the rules about office romances are. I could have sued him then for unfair dismissal, and he might have sacked you too, Katie retorted, knowing full well that that would never have happened. Patrick was too big a part of the agency. His contacts book was full of names and telephone numbers of all the big hitters in the industry. Patrick knew the people who really mattered, while at twenty-four she was still only halfway up her career ladder. The ladder that had now been effectively pulled out from under her. Keeping their affair a secret for the past nine months had been romantic at first, but lately Katie had begun to suspect that it was a convenient ruse, allowing Patrick to be able to use Hugo's no couples in the office rule as an excuse for keeping their relationship under wraps from everyone, not just their co-workers. She'd wanted to introduce him to her parents on the visit home last summer, and had suggested they have a weekend in Dartmouth with them. But Patrick had turned down the idea with some feeble excuse that she couldn't even remember now, and she'd gone to see her parents on her own. Maybe Hugo did know about them, and that's why he hadn't told Patrick his decision to include her in his redundancies. As if sensing her thoughts, Patrick put his arms around her, there will be benefits about not working here. We can come out now about you and me when you're working in another office. If I can find another job, Katie said, you know what the work situation's like down here? The last thing I want to do is move to London. Big cities were not her scene. Bristol was large enough for her any day. Something will turn up. I'll put some feelers out, see what I can find. Come on, cheer up, Katie. It's not the end of the world. 
You've got a good redundancy package there. But I want a job. I like work. She glared at him. Huh? You even knew about the redundancy package I get. You knew and chose not to tell me. Thanks a lot. Patrick at least had the decency to look guilty. OK. I'm sorry. I thought it was best left to Hugo to do the dirty. Anyway, you'll get another job soon enough. Trust me. Patrick had said. He had then helped her carry the box to her car, and so the last year of her working life had ended. That was two days ago, and neither she nor Patrick had managed to uncover any likely jobs, which was why on Friday evening she'd phoned Matty to tell her the news, and then impulsively decided to accept her godmother's invitation to visit and have a short holiday. Since her parents had retired to Spain a few years ago, her visits home had dwindled down to one or two a year, a fact that she felt increasingly guilty over, as she knew Matty missed her company. Matty's idea of her taking over a good yarn did have a certain appeal, Katie had to admit, and spending the summer months in Dartmouth, where there was always a gentle breeze off the river even on the hottest days, rather than suffering the stifling heat of town, would definitely be a bonus. She could just regard it as a career break, something different to charge the batteries. She could always go back to town if it didn't work out. Other people had career breaks, so why not her? Where would she live, though? She was used to her independence these days, and her godmother would probably suggest she live here in the cottage with her which, in lots of ways, would be good for both of them, but... Oh, what to do, Bert? Katie stroked the dog as his black nose nudged her hand for attention. Shall I come back and take on Matty's shop? Or shall I stay in Bristol and try going freelance until something permanent turns up? Matty returned at that moment with a tea and a large key which she pushed across the table to Katie. Here, she said, take this and go and have a look later. Katie picked up the key thoughtfully. What will you do if I don't take on the shop? Run it right down over the summer and have a closing down sale in the autumn. Maybe see if the developers renovating the place next door would still be interested. Matty shrugged. I've got another year to keep it out of the hands of the Black Orton cousins. Ron keeps harping on about getting his rights from the old family agreement. Katie looked at her. Ron? Too long a story to go into now, but I do know I'll be racked with guilt if I do close Mother's business and sell up after all these years. Even though it was always meant to be Clara's, not mine. I never wanted it in the first place. I thought you loved the shop. Enjoyed working there. You're always bright and cheerful serving customers and you love knitting. Strange, Katie thought. How mistaken you could be about people close to you. I didn't have a choice after the war ended and Clara was dead. Mother needed me. So, here I stayed, knitting needles in hand, Mattie said. She refrained from adding that She'd thought her life would be so different to the way it had turned out. She'd never envisaged spending nearly half a century running a wool shop. Katie remembered being scared of old Ma Cranford as a child. Secretly, she and Polly, her best friend growing up and still a close friend, had nicknamed her The Witch and stayed as far away from her as possible. She could well understand a young Matty all those years ago, being made to tow the dutiful daughter line with no argument allowed. Don't go thinking it was all bad, Matty said. I enjoyed being in charge after Mother died and I was running the business my way. But these days there are so many new rules and regulations. I guess, too, I'm old-fashioned and not business-like enough. Matty glanced at Katie. Remember how you enjoyed being my Saturday girl for years? Polly, too, before she got bitten by the sailing bug. Does she know you're redundant and down for a visit? 
had lunch with her last week, Katie said. Dexter was away at a farming conference, so we had a girly day. They'll be down in the summer, so you'll see them then. Matty laughed as she stood up and began to collect the tea things. I'll never forget those fluorescent stripy leg warmers you both knitted one winter, orange and green. Your teachers were less than impressed when you wore them to school, though. I'd forgotten those, Katie said. I did lots of knitting and sewing in those days, didn't I? Yes, and that's why you're perfect to take on a good yarn. You know how to knit and do other things, besides you and... Matty hesitated, and Katie looked at her. Besides what? You're young and businesslike, and you know how to turn the heel of a sock, Matty said, deciding not to put into words the secret hope she cherished for Katie's future. There was nothing she could do to edge that particular dream into reality. So, oh, Matty, just because I can turn the heel of a sock doesn't mean I can run a wool shop, Katie said, laughing. She refrained from adding, even if I want to. Chapter Two Half an hour later, Katie walked down through the narrow streets towards the River Dart and Matty's shop. A few people were wandering around, enjoying the early evening sunshine, negotiating the granite steps between Newcomen Road and Lower Street. Katie turned towards Bayard's Cove. She stood on the ancient cobbles of the cove for several moments, taking in the view where the river Dart flowed between the twin castles, Dartmouth Castle, and on the other side of the river, the smaller King's Weir Castle. Walking slowly along the ancient quay, past houses that had once housed Dartmouth's first hospital and the customs house, she reached the 16th century Bayard's Cove fort, with its ancient gun ports ready for the guns to be trained on invaders. She stood within its circular walls for a few moments, bending down to look out through a gun port to the castle at the mouth of the river. Katie loved the history of this part of town. On an evening like this, with few people around, standing, listening to the water slapping gently against the stone sea walls, Looking at the preserved ancient buildings, it was easy to visualise how it had looked centuries ago, when pirates and smugglers had roamed the Devonshire coast. Deep in thought, she turned and made her way back along the quay, and minutes later she was outside, a good yarn, pushing the quay into the lock. Once inside, she instinctively reached for the light switch on the right-hand wall, and pushed the door closed behind her with her foot, before slipping the Yale lock into place. Half-empty shelves of wool nestled alongside boxes of buttons, stands of tapestry kits, embroidery silks, zips of all lengths, knitting needles, knitting patterns, crochet hooks, elastic, cottons. Even a bale or two of material lurked, hidden, on a high shelf. As a wool and haberdashery shop, a good yarn was definitely stuck in the wrong century. Even as a Saturday girl years ago, Katie had known that the shop was decidedly old-fashioned, and Matty hadn't done much, if anything, in the last few years to modernise it in any way. Without seeing the accounts, Katie would put money on the fact that a good yarn had done nothing more than break even for the last few years. She wondered if, in fact, it would even manage to do that this year, with so little stock on the shelves. If you believe the gossip in the magazines, knitting was all the rage these days, with celebs proudly clicking their needles all over the place and rushing to join stitch-and-bitch clubs. Could she start a local version? Katie fingered a ball of white angora wool abandoned on a shelf. If she did take on the shop, she'd have to come up with something to grab people's interest, something to bring the shop into the 21st century. Katie opened the door to the back stockroom. Rows of empty shelves showed that Matty had been running stock down for some time. Would it be possible to turn it into a clubroom? 
hold knitting or craft workshops on a regular basis. It was a large enough room. Keep the stock to a minimum, or even store it somewhere else, upstairs maybe. Closing the door, she climbed the narrow, twisting stairs up to the first floor, with its two empty rooms and an old-fashioned bathroom. She'd forgotten about these rooms. A possible kitchen? A bedroom? Could she perhaps live over the shop? The attic that spanned the width of the building gave her the answer. The large room, with its dormer windows looking out towards the two castles at the mouth of the river, was dusty and empty, save for an ancient wicker chair and a few old battered cardboard boxes. In her mind's eye, it was instantly transformed into a delightful sitting room with comfy settees and chairs, bookshelves holding her books and CDs. Yes, she could definitely live up here. Deep in thought, Katie made her way back downstairs and stood in the entrance to the stockroom, taking in its dimensions again and lost in her thoughts. Taking over the shop would certainly solve her immediate problem of finding a job. It had helped Matty, too. It could be fun to spend a summer down here again, revisit some of her old haunts. She could... Katie screamed as a pair of burly arms wrapped around her and held her tight. Gotcha! What the hell do you think you're up to? Relief flooded through Katie's body as she recognised the voice. Leo Cranford, let me go, it's me, Katie. Tiggy! If there'd been any doubt in Katie's mind that her captor was Leo Cranford, his use of her childish nickname was enough to dispel it. I told you, don't call me that. You know I hate it, now let me go. Sharply jarring her elbows back into Leo's body, she tw- What are you doing here? he demanded, staring at her as she rubbed her arms where he'd gripped them. Never mind what I'm doing. What the hell are you playing at? Frightening me like that. And how did you get in? I slipped the latch. Leo held out a key. Maddie gave me this years ago in case of emergencies. I saw the light on downstairs and thought someone had broken in. You're lucky I didn't call the police. Deciding her best policy was to say nothing, Katie glared at him. Leo had had quite a short temper in the past. So what exactly are you doing in Maddie's shop? Working out whether it's a feasible business proposition. For Matty? For me, Katie said. You coming back? Giving up all things me, ja? Katie tried not to smile at Leo's deliberate, usual mispronunciation of media. Yes. But you couldn't wait to get away. Said nothing would ever drag you back down here. A girl can change her mind, can't she? Leo regarded her thoughtfully for several seconds before holding out his hand. In that case, welcome home. Leo's farm work hardened hand all but crushed her fingers as he took her hand in his. The final decision to return seemed to have been taken the moment Leo asked if she was giving up all things media. Leo walked back to Matty's with Katie and gave in easily to his aunt's invitation. You'll stay for supper, won't you? Help me persuade Katie to take on a good yarn. No persuading necessary. I've decided I'll do it, Katie said, and immediately found herself engulfed in a tight hug from Matty. Oh, I'm so pleased. Thank you. Though, heaven knows what I'm letting myself in for. I do have a few ideas for attracting customers, but really, I know nothing about running any sort of shop, let alone a wool shop. Oh, you'll soon get the hang of it, Matty said. I'll be around to help out for a few weeks before I go on holiday. Good. We'll have to work out a plan of action, Katie said. The shop could do with a spot of decorating before we restock it. After supper, we'll have a brainstorming session, Matty said. Leo can give us a man's point of view. Hmm, Katie said, smothering a laugh and glancing across at Leo. Remembering his teenage skull and crossbones decorating pays, she wasn't at all sure she wanted to hear Leo's views 
on how to smarten up the shop. First thing is to get the place spruced up, paint the walls white, open up the space. New shelf units. I can't stay here with you forever, she said quickly, as she saw Matty was about to protest. I suppose not, but at least for the first couple of months, Matty said. If I go on the Mediterranean cruise I've dreamt of for years, it'd be good to have you staying here to look after Bert. Can't put him in kennels. That makes sense. OK, I think I'd better go home tomorrow, Katie said. Get things organised up there. Give notice on my flat. Say goodbye to friends. Any friend in particular? Leo asked. Mainly my old colleagues from work. And Patrick, Katie said. How Patrick would react to her plans would be interesting. Hopefully he'd be pleased for her. Before Leo could start asking questions about who Patrick was, Katie quickly added, There's also a couple of factory outlets up there I'd like to take a look at. See if I can get some ideas for stock. I'll drive back down either next Sunday or as soon as I can get away, if that's OK with you, she said, looking at Matty. In time for tea on Sunday would be good, Matty said. OK, but go easy on the clotted cream. Eat too many of your famous teas and I'll end up getting fat. You fat rubbish, Leo said. Anyway, you could do with a bit more meat on you. You're a bit too skinny for me. Oh, really? Katie said. Then it's just as well I'm nothing to do with you, isn't it? Matty laughed. Isn't you two just like old times already? Oh, it's going to be great fun having the pair of you together again. Chapter 3 After waving Katie off on Monday morning, Matty made her way down to the shop. Last night... The three of them had decided she would put a notice on the door, informing everyone that the shop was closing for a short time and would reopen under new management at the end of the month. Leo had said he'd meet her down there, and they'd start to plan how to give the place a modern-day makeover. Patty looked around the shop where she'd spent so much of her life. Was she doing the right thing? Handing the place over to Katie? The war? and Clara's death had meant she'd had no choice over accepting her own unwanted legacy. Leaving at school at fifteen at her mother's insistence to help in the shop hadn't been her choice. But times were different then. Everyone was shell-shocked after the war. Rationing was still in effect, and people were struggling to get their lives back onto an even keel. Options for girls after the war were limited too and parents had the final say, as their opinions dictated what happened until you were at least. By the time of her twenty-first birthday, though, Matty had accepted the way of her life and had decided that she had no choice but to make the best of things. When her mother became ill, with the illness that would eventually kill her at eighty-nine, Matty had drifted into being semi-in charge of the shop. With the death of her mother, a good yarn became her full responsibility, and she'd seize the opportunity to really do things her way. For the last decade or so, a good yarn had thrived under her command, until it had all started to become too much to handle on her own, and sometime in the last three years, things had started to slide. She didn't want to force Katie to follow in her footsteps down a road in life she wasn't enthusiastic about. She simply couldn't do that. But Katie hadn't rejected the idea outright, had she? In fact, once she'd agreed, she was positively brimming with ideas for the place. A good yarn had been a successful business once. Surely it could be again. It just needed a modern style of management, and there was no doubt Katie would infuse the place with up-to-date ideas. Matty jumped as the shop doorbell jangled and Leo appeared. Morning. You look deep in thought, Leo said. I was trying to reassure myself that I'm doing the right thing by Katie. Matty said, don't want to lumber her with a business that's beyond saving. I doubt that Katie would take it on if she didn't think she could make a go of it, Leo said. 
I'd have thought the shop had lots of potential. The idea of using the old stockroom for craft workshops is a good one, too. Matty winced as the noise of banging and shouting from next door resonated through the shop. Seems like the developers are back. Been quiet in there for months. Must have got an injection of cash, she said. Hope they don't cause too much disruption. But it'd be good to see the old salt house get a lick of paint, even if it is being turned into yet more flats. Right, ideas for this place. Last night, Katie was talking about having white paint everywhere and a spacious, modern look to the place. Leo said, Think that old dresser could do with pulling out? Matty said, Part open shelves and part glass cupboard. It completely filled the wall behind the counter. It's been there forever. Maybe now is the time to take it out. Put something more modern in. Leo shook his head as he moved behind the counter. Gotta disagree there. This distressed dresser is perfect, as it is. Matty looked at him. Distressed? Don't know about that. It looks downright miserable to me and in need of a good... Trust me on this one, it'll be fine. A modern fashion statement. Think that wartime utility unit over there needs to come out, though. What's this? Leo bent down and gently pulled at a photograph trapped between the wooden shelves of the bottom dresser cupboard. Closing the dresser door, he glanced at the faded, grainy black-and-white photograph as he handed it to Matty. A boyish-looking man in uniform, his arm around the shoulders of a pretty young woman, were both laughing at the camera, while a young girl clung to the man's back, her arms flung tight around his neck in a determined effort not to fall off. Oh, that's me with Clara and her American G.I. boyfriend who was stationed here for a few months during the war. Matty said he was lovely. So sad he died. You all look as though you were having fun that day. Oh, we were, Matty said, handing the photo back to Leo for a closer look. Memories of that long-ago day flooded into her mind. It had been such a happy day. Gallant's Bower Woods out by the castle had been classified as out of bounds to the locals, but Hal, Clara's boyfriend, had sneaked them through for a picnic in the woods with another G.I. and his girlfriend. The two Americans had even brought candies and a bottle of lemonade for her as part of the picnic. Sworn to secrecy, Matty had never told anyone about that afternoon, when, for a couple of hours, the small corner of her world had been such a happy place, despite the war raging around the rest of the world. The row that broke out two nights later, between Clara and their parents, was a bitter one, ending with Clara being forbidden to see Hal ever again. From then on, not only was there war with Germany, there was a full-out war between Clara and their parents. Nobody explained to Matty what the row was about. Clara, when Matty asked why their parents were being so horrible about Hal, had wearily responded, Ma and Pa are so bigoted against the Americans they won't listen to reason. As soon as this war's over, though, they're jolly well going to have to listen, and once I'm twenty-one, I won't need their permission. I can marry whoever I want to. Matty had looked at her sister, wide-eyed. You're going to marry Hal. Won't you have to go and live in America, then? Clara had smiled at her. Yes, I'm going to marry Hal and live in America with him. But don't worry. When that day happens, I'll make sure you come and visit us. That day had never arrived. Instead, Operation Tiger, and the light had disappeared out of Clara's eyes. Leo gently tapped Matty on the shoulder and gave her the photo back. You okay? Matty nodded. Yes, just remembering and wishing things could have turned out differently for Clara. I'll pop this in with the family photos when I get home. Now, what are we going to do to get this place ready for Katie to work her magic? Leo said, and the two of them spent the rest of the morning preparing the shop for its makeover. That afternoon at home, Matty took the photograph out of her bag. Oh, Clara, she said. 
gently stroking the image of her sister's face. The past is past. But I so wish you'd had a future too. We both deserved so much more. She pulled the box out of the sideboard, and with one last look, she carefully placed the photo inside along with the others before closing it again and putting it back in the sideboard. Chapter Four A oh, wool shop? As for grannies, you're too young to bury yourself in the country. What's happened to your career plans? Patrick ran his hands through his dark, foppishly cut hair. I can't believe you're serious about this. Back in Bristol, Katie had invited Patrick over for a takeaway curry supper at her flat, telling him she needed to talk to him. He'd wanted to go out to eat, but she'd refused, telling him her plans would best be done in private. Patrick had taken one look at the state of the sitting room, devoid of its usual pictures, cushions and candles, all packed away in boxes ready for the journey to Devon, and had immediately demanded to know what was going on. His reaction had been one of horror, and now, after a glass or two of wine, he was attempting to talk her into changing her mind, although currently it felt more like he was bullying her. Redundancy happened, Katie said. Perhaps a change of direction's what I need. Besides, Matty needs me. I'm doing this for her as much as me. Patrick shook his head in disbelief. Because some old woman has played on your conscience, you're going home to run a doomed business. Matty's my godmother, not some random old woman, Katie snapped. Whatever reaction she'd expected from Patrick, it wasn't this rhetoric against Matty. This was a different Patrick to the one she'd known for the past months, and it was one that shocked her. She'd thought that they were both on the same wavelength. Neither of them had ever mentioned the word love to the other, but she'd accepted that he was a workaholic and was very ambitious, and had come to realise, too, that on occasions he could be a little insensitive, to say the least. She didn't play on my conscience. We've agreed I'll give it a year, and if it doesn't work out, a good yarn will be sold. What about us? When are we going to see each other? I'll only be two hours down the motorway. One and a half the way you drive, Katie said. You can come for long weekends once I'm settled in the flat. That's something else. I thought we could look for a new place for the two of us up here in Clifton. Finally move in together, show the world we're a couple. But now we're breaking up.